On December 5th, a Hughes 369D helicopter crashed near Pryor, Oklahoma while conducting power line observation work. The pilot was the only person on board and was fatally injured. The NTSB has now released its preliminary report. And as always, a preliminary report doesn't tell us why an accident happened. It doesn't assign blame. What it does do is give us verified facts, timing, conditions, witness observations, and sometimes those facts are enough to start understanding the mechanism of what went wrong. In this case, the report gives us several very important clues about how this loss of control developed, especially at extremely low speed and low altitude. And once we slow down and really look at those details, the sequence starts to make aerodynamic sense, even though the outcome was sudden and unforgiving. Before we talk about numbers or aerodynamics, it's important to reset expectations because this was not a normal helicopter flight. This aircraft was not flying from one airport to another. It wasn't cruising. It wasn't climbing out. It wasn't transitioning through the airspace system. According to the preliminary report, this helicopter was conducting aerial observation work, visually monitoring power line replacement operations. That single sentence tells us a lot about how this helicopter was being flown. Aerial observation work means low altitude. It means slow movement. It means the pilot's attention is primarily outside the cockpit, tracking something on the ground, often for extended periods of time. The helicopter isn't being flown from point A to point B. It's being positioned, nudged, held, and adjusted continuously. In other words, this is precision flying. And precision flying in a helicopter almost always happens very close to hover. Now, hover flight is not inherently unsafe. Helicopters are designed to hover. But hover flight comes with a very important trade-off, energy. When you're hovering, or nearly hovering, you have very little of it. There's no meaningful airspeed to trade for lift. There's no altitude buffer to work with. The helicopter is being held in the air almost entirely by power and rotor efficiency. That means the margin between stable flight and unstable flight can be very thin. This is especially true during utility and observation work, where the helicopter often lives right at the edge of that stable zone for long periods of time. And that's not a criticism. That's just the nature of the job. These operations are safe every day, all over the world, because pilots manage that narrow margin carefully. But it does mean that when something disturbs that balance, even briefly, there isn't much room to absorb it. What this tells us is that the context of this flight matters just as much as the aircraft itself. The helicopter wasn't doing something unusual for its mission, but it was operating in a part of the flight envelope where small changes can have outsized effects. That's the frame we need to keep in mind as we move forward, because the next detail in the report builds directly on this. If you read the NTSB preliminary report carefully, one number quietly stands out. According to the report, the helicopter was moving at about four knots. At first glance, that might not sound important. Four knots is walking speed. To someone who doesn't fly helicopters, it might even sound reassuring. Slow feels safe. Slow feels controlled. But in helicopter aerodynamics, four knots changes everything. At very low forward speeds, a helicopter loses something called translational lift. That's the extra efficiency the rotor system gets when it's moving through clean, undisturbed air. Above roughly 15 to 20 knots, the rotor is constantly biting into fresh air, and lift becomes easier to maintain. Below that range, and especially near hover, the rotor is working in its own downwash. The air is already disturbed. Lift becomes less efficient. The helicopter needs more precise control inputs and more power just to stay where it is. At around four knots, you're essentially hovering with a slight drift. And in that regime, the helicopter becomes much more sensitive to everything. Small cyclic inputs matter more. Small airflow changes matter more. Even subtle movements can alter how the rotor disc is loaded. This is why slow flight near hover is often riskier than moderate forward flight. At higher airspeeds, the aircraft has stability from airflow. At very low airspeeds, stability comes almost entirely from pilot input and rotor behavior. There's another piece to this as well. When a helicopter is moving very slowly, it doesn't just have less lift efficiency, it also has less time. If something starts to go wrong, there's no airspeed to smooth it out and no altitude to convert into recovery energy. Everything happens close to the ground, and it happens fast. 
So when the preliminary report tells us this helicopter was moving at about four knots, what it's really telling us is that the aircraft was operating in a very precise, very unforgiving part of its flight envelope. This doesn't mean something had to go wrong, but it does mean that once something did go wrong, the options would be limited. And that sets the stage for the next detail in the report, the witness descriptions, which help us understand how this situation may have transitioned from controlled flight to loss of control in just a few moments. One of the most telling details in the preliminary report comes from witnesses on the ground. Several describe the helicopter moving backward shortly before it pitched nose down and struck the terrain. That description is important, not because witnesses can diagnose an accident, but because direction of motion in a helicopter, especially near hover, has real aerodynamic consequences. Backward movement is fundamentally different from forward flight. In forward flight, even at low speed, airflow through the rotor disc is relatively organized. The rotor is constantly encountering fresh air, and lift tends to be more uniform across the disc. In rearward or sideways motion, that organization starts to break down. Parts of the rotor disc may be encountering air that has already been disturbed by the rotor itself. Other parts may be seeing relatively cleaner air. That uneven airflow can produce uneven lift, and when lift becomes uneven across the disc, Stability can change very quickly. What makes this particularly relevant here is that the report does not describe a large, intentional rearward maneuver. The wording suggests a drift, something that developed, not something that was commanded aggressively. That distinction matters. A slow, unintended rearward drift can be surprisingly difficult to detect immediately during aerial observation work. The pilot's reference points are external and often fixed on the task at hand. The helicopter may still feel in position until the motion becomes pronounced enough to catch the eye. By the time that happens, the rotor system may already be operating in a less stable airflow environment. Witnesses then described a rapid nose-down pitch. That transition is critical. A gradual settling or descent looks very different from a sudden attitude change. A nose-down pitch suggests a loss of controlled rotor behavior rather than a simple power or performance shortfall. This is where the sequence accelerates. Once the rotor system is no longer producing predictable lift, control inputs don't result in the expected response. The helicopter doesn't slowly drift out of tolerance. It departs from stable flight. And because this was happening close to the ground, there was no time for the situation to evolve slowly. What may have started as a small positional change became a loss of control in moments. This is not about a single action or a single mistake. It's about how quickly helicopter aerodynamics can change when operating near hover, and how little warning there can be when that change begins. That leads directly into the question of why the aircraft itself could not ride through this instability. And that brings us to the rotor system design. The Hughes 369D uses a teetering rotor system, a design that has been in service for decades and is well understood throughout the helicopter community. This system is light, responsive, and efficient, but it also has very specific requirements. Chief among them is continuous, positive loading of the rotor disc. As long as the rotor remains loaded, the aircraft behaves predictably. Problems arise when that loading is interrupted. Rotor disc unloading doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't require aerobatic maneuvering or extreme control inputs. It can occur when lift across the disc momentarily decreases, allowing the fuselage to move independently of the rotor system. When that happens, the helicopter's attitude can change rapidly, sometimes faster than a pilot can counter, especially close to the ground. It's important to be clear here. The preliminary report does not state that a specific mechanical failure occurred. It does not identify mast bumping. It does not describe a particular control input, and it does not assign cause. But it does place this helicopter in a flight regime where disc unloading, if it occurs, becomes immediately critical. At very low airspeed and very low altitude, there is no buffer. There is no time to reload the disc gradually. There is no altitude available to trade for airflow. There is no opportunity to let the aircraft settle back into stable flight. Once the helicopter began to pitch nose down, the physics effectively closed the door on recovery. This is often difficult for people to accept especially those more familiar with fixed-wing aircraft. In airplanes, loss of control often unfolds over time. 
There may be warning signs. There may be altitude to work with. There may be options. In this case, there were none. The helicopter was already operating at the bottom edge of its energy envelope. When stability was lost, there was no aerodynamic path back to controlled flight. The outcome was determined not by intent or effort, but by geometry, airflow, and gravity. That's why this accident appears so sudden from the outside, and that's why recovery was unlikely once the sequence began. This investigation is still ongoing, and it's important to let the NTSB do its work. There are questions that remain unanswered, and there will be more factual information to come. But even at this early stage, the preliminary report highlights a critical lesson about helicopter operations. Low-speed observation and utility work demands constant precision, not because it's reckless, but because it leaves very little margin when something changes unexpectedly. The aircraft, the aerodynamics, and the environment are all tightly coupled. This accident isn't about a mistake. It's about a situation where the window for recovery was extremely narrow. And once that window closed, the outcome was determined by physics. That's why understanding these details matters. And that's how we honor the purpose of these reports. Learning, not judging. Take care, and I'll see you next time.